thunder of jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! Now look, a whirl in the vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle! And friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel. With his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose. And a host of others. Hurry, Bullwinkle! The show's about to start! Oh, I'm coming as fast as I can! Wait to the people! Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The theme, John Music. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. We're going to have a lot of fun. Come on and join us. Sure, there's always room for one more. Bullwinkle has been having a wonderful time with that trunk full of Confederate money he found. He's been sailing paper airplanes made of $50 bills, even cutting out paper dolls of $10 each. Little does he know that it isn't Confederate money at all, but real United States currency stolen from the town bank. Boy, look at that one go! Rocky has been searching for him frantically and finally resorts to using a Frostbite Falls Mother Moose call. The sound of it reached Bullwinkle as he was flying a kite made of $100 bills. Coming, Mother! But when Rocky blew again, it wasn't Bullwinkle who showed up at all. You called? Pokey Smoke, who are you? Allow me to introduce myself. Honey Child Moose Moss from way below the Moose and Dixon lies. Gee, welcome to Minnesota, Miss Moose Moss. Rocky behaved like a little gentleman, but Honey Child didn't act like a lady at all. Fortunately, she was stopped by a strange sound. Well, how did you do, do? Bullwinkle, it's you. Did you find the bank robbers and the money? How about introducing me to your bank robbers? No, I remember. Yes, it seemed that Bullwinkle's period of amnesia was over. Did I find the money, boy? Have I got a surprise for you, Rock? And Bullwinkle grabbed the straw police and flung it open. Well? Well, aren't you surprised at what's in there? Three pairs of socks and a peanut butter sandwich. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, indeed. Honey Child Moose Moss, alias Babyface Braunschweiger. Alias bought his bed enough. Had traded suitcases with Bullwinkle and now had possession of the police full of money. And now it's bye-bye Boris. But as the disguised villain started off... Hey, what's your hurry, little missy? Well, I gotta go way down upon the Swanee River. To see the old folks at home, huh? Hey, Bullwinkle, that valise looks just like yours. How about that? Small world, isn't it, mister? Her name's Honey Child Moose Moss. Of the Florida the Moose Mosses. I just knew you were from the South on account of your southern fried accent. Um, no offense, Miss Moose Moss, but could we see inside your suitcase? Sir, no southern gentleman ever peeking inside ladies' pocketbook. That's a pocketbook? Large economy size. Gee, maybe I didn't have the money after all, Rock. Yeah. Maybe I dreamed it. Yeah. Maybe I'm just a stupid lame brain. Yeah. Couldn't you hesitate a little on that one? Well, I really must be going, y'all. Yeah. Well, it was a clear-cut victory for Boris until a strange object floated down near our friends. Bullwinkle, it's a kite made of hundred-dollar bills. Must be the deluxe model, and that ain't... Hey, that's my kite. Right. You did have the money, Bullwinkle. I think I hear my dear old mammy calling Caroline. But your name's Honey Child. That's my maiden name. Well, so long, Yankees. Grab that suitcase, Bullwinkle. And as Boris sped away, Bullwinkle seized the valise. Good work. Yeah. Open it up. Right. What's in it? Three pairs of socks and a peanut butter sandwich. Bullwinkle, she tricked us. Yeah, them southern me, sir, pretty slick. After her, Bullwinkle. <laughs> it's a pleasure. But in a few steps, Bullwinkle stopped short. Look there, Rock. Sure enough, on a nearby bush was Boris's false wig and antlers. You know what that means, Bullwinkle? Yeah, she's been scalped. No, no. Confound them Apaches anyway. Listen, it. We'll head them off at the pack. Bullwinkle, mm -hmm. it's a wig. She wasn't a real blonde. She wasn't a real moose. She wasn't even a real she. Well, will Boris make it to the train station and escape unscathed? On what? Uh, we'll find out next time in the Midnight Choo Choo or This Gum for Hire. Keep that up, young fella, and you'll wake the whole neighborhood. Watch out, Pop. He's liable to sink his teeth in you. Junior, apparently you've forgotten one of my most frequently quoted proverbs. Which one is that, Pop? Barking dogs seldom bite. <laughs> well, barking big dogs seldom bite. Which paves the way very nicely to my fable, entitled The Hound and the Wolf. 
Once there was a pasture filled with the most edible grass you ever saw. And when you have a pasture with edible grass, you usually have a flock of sheep. Unfortunately, the sheep are also edible, especially to a pack of wolves. Last today, Gus. Wednesday. That's what I thought. We have mutton on Wednesday, do we not? Usually. Then let us have at them edible sheep. And just like that, the wicked scavengers trotted up to the flock. Although this particular flock had no shepherd to guard them, they did have a sheepdog. Mauler was his name, and for a very good reason. <laughs> Cotton picking wolves. Now, this entire scene had been witnessed by another wolf who had a reputation for being the craftiest in the world. I think I will decimate yonder sheepdog and then partake of a lamb dinner. As you can see, this wolf was not the slightest bit afraid of sheepdogs. And why should he be? He never fought them tooth and claw, he used a fencing foil. On guard, eh, sheepdog? Ordinarily, that was enough to send the guardian of the flock to greener fire hydrants. But Mauler had a row of molars that didn't know the meaning of the word fear. Without his foil, the wolf was helpless. Cotton-picking wolves. Cotton-picking fencing wolves. Mauler returned to his chores, and at sundown, after he had locked up the flock, headed for home. Unknown to him, he had a shadow. No sheepdog can do what he did to me and get away with it. Inside his split-level thatched hut, Mauler sat down to a plate of bone. Hard bone at that. <coughs> hmm. I, I guess I'll have to gum my way through. So saying, he removed that formidable row of molars. Hey, they're store bought That was all the wolf needed to know. He would swipe the teeth and the sheep would be defenseless. Good afternoon, sir. I'd like to get your opinion on a new soft drink. Well, what's it called? Sheepdog Cola. Actually, it was nothing more than a concentrated dose of knockout drops. Don't listen to him, baby. Go ahead, take a slug and let me know what you think. Well? Uh, well, which? How do you feel? I feel fine. You don't feel sick? No, my gums itch. How about sleep? You feel sleepy? Not the least. Hmm, must be something wrong. <laughs> Two nights later, after sleeping it off in Battle Creek, Michigan, the wolf returned to the thatched hut. Quick, quick, there's a starving tiger out there with a T-bone steak, and it's so tough he can't chew it. That's awful. Those were my words exactly. What could I do to help? Have you got any false teeth he can chew with? Just those over on the table. They'll do fine. Now, wait a minute. You said it was a tiger out there. There are no tigers around here. Did I say tiger? I meant a three-toed sloth. No, three-toed sloth is around here either. That's sleeve. Plural of sloth is sleeve. Oh, what do you have around here? Uh, just sheep, dogs, a wolf. Well, one of them is out there with a tough T-bone. Then give him my brand new steak knife. Yeah. You know, you've got tolerance. That's what you got. And you know something? That wolf was so overcome with the dog's generosity, he actually believed his story was true. Hold on! I'm coming! One week later, the wolf gave it another try. Merry Christmas, sheepdog! Santa Claus. He knows me. Uh, what are you going to give me, sheepdog? Give you? You usually do the giving. Well, it's been a tough winter, kid. Well, I'll be happy to give you some, Santa. Anything in particular you would like? Yeah, false teeth. But if I give you my false teeth, I would not be able to protect the sheep. Yeah, well, that's the way Christmas is sometimes. The crafty wolf was about to grab the teeth when a noise came from the fireplace and... Merry Christmas! Santa Claus! A ringer. But if you are Santa, then who is... Needless to say, the wolf beat a hasty retreat. But not so hasty that he didn't take the time to swipe the teeth. Bright and early the next day, the wolf boldly approached the flock. Sheep, you and I having lunch together. <laughs> Don't get me, sheepdog. You ain't got no teeth, so you can't bite me. I'm taking this fat little lamb. True, Mauler couldn't bite, but the fat little lamb could. <laughs> that wolf took off, never to be seen again. Oh, I didn't know lambs had teeth like that, Pa. Well, you see, son, this particular flock was owned by a dentist. He had fitted them all with false teeth. So that's why I say barking dogs seldom bite. I got a better one. Nothing dentured. Nothing gained. Nothing just... Uh, how about a glass of sheepdog cola, son, hmm? And now, here's that man with the wisdom of the ages, Mr. Know-it-all. Hello there, friends. Today's wisdom comes from the ages of three through five and a half, going on six. Today, we are going to learn how to sell the encyclopedia door to door. First one simply goes for the direct approach. You just knock on the door. Hello, kindly sir. I would like you to use this handsome volume of the encyclopedia absolutely free of charge. Go ahead. I insist you use it with no obligation whatsoever. Next, of course, you impress the potential buyer with the sheer size of the entire set. Hello again, knowledge-hungry kind man. Would you believe it, sir? There are over 350 pounds of these beautifully bound books standing here. And then, naturally, there is the play on his ignorance method. Hello again, dear customer. I now open volume one and I see here aardvark. Now admit uh, it, sir, you are totally ignorant on the subject of aardvarks. <laughs> Baseball. <laughs> cream kumquats. Mousetrap. Muskelons. Pies. Plumbing. Steam boilers. 
Xylophones. This is... Gosh, Bullwinkle, you didn't sell a set. What are you going to do now? I don't know yet, Rock, but there's one whole volume here that tells you how to give them away. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Nothing up my sleeve. Presto! <laughs> Wrong hat. I take a seven and a half. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. <laughs> Hello out there. Peabody and Sherman here. How would you like a trip to the mountain, Sherman? The Rockies, Mr. Peabody? No, the Andes. To a tiny village high atop those lofty peaks called Cusco. Who lived there? The Incas, a tribe of noble Indians who ruled Peru centuries ago. Set the back machine for the year 1532. And we shall be eyewitnesses when the Incas are conquered by that noted explorer and soldier, Francisco Pizarro. We enter the way back and we're immediately hurtled back through time and space. In 1532, Cusco was nothing more than a small village, and a seemingly deserted village at that. Where is everyone? Before I could answer, we were ringed in by a cage of spears. Make one false move and you goners. Uh, one moment, Chief. I believe you're mistaking us for someone else. You're not Pizarro. Right, I'm not Pizarro. Little boy Pizarro? No, I'm Sherman. Then you must be Pizarro. I'm your wife. We were taken inside the Chief's hut and given a tall, refreshing glass of llama milk. I must say, Chief, I'm quite surprised to see you only have one or two hundred men in Cusco. Most of Incas have gone to India. India? Incas, Mr. Peabody? Drink your milk, Sherman. We hear them rumor that Francisco Pizarro is on way up here to conquer us. I'm afraid you're right, Chief. It's in history that way. Well, we got them planned for Pizarro. When he get them here, we're gonna let them have it. But you can't. According to history books, Pizarro conquered you. Then we make them liar out of books. We gotta warn Mr. Pizarro, Mr. Peabody. I heartily agree, my boy. Well, it was the custom of the Incas to dally away their afternoons playing mahjong. And while they were so occupied, Sherman and I took the opportunity of leaving. We were almost out of the village when who should appear but Francisco Pizarro and two lieutenants. In the name of His Majesty, I claim this village as mine. What are you gonna name this place, Francisco? I gonna name it after me. Let me see. Hmm. The soil here is sandy. That's it. I gonna call it Sandy Francisco. Crazy. Uh, Senor Pizarro. I don't know whether you're aware of this or not, but 200 Incas are waiting to ambush you. Oh, don't be silly. Most of the Incas are over in India. Uh, and if this little boy make that bad gag again, I'm gonna throw him over the cliff. Try as I may, I couldn't convince the great explorer that he was walking into a trap. In fact, you can imagine my consternation when Pizarro and his men suddenly curled up in the very heart of the city. It's time for a nap. Well, naturally, the Mahjong tournament had to break up sometime, and... Oh, my gosh! Here comes the chief and his men. It was too late to awaken Pizarro, so we did the next best thing. We disguised him. What is it you got there? Uh, these, uh, these are llamas. I never see llamas like that before. Well, well, well th these are from Tibet. They're, they're high llamas. These look like llamas to you? Not to me. Me neither. What they look like to you? Donkeys. Unfortunately, Pizarro was a man who required very little sleep, for he chose that moment to crawl out from under the skins. It is donkey. No, it is a man. In the name of His Majesty, you are all under arrest. But needless to say, this didn't speak for the chief's approval. It wasn't long before Pizarro, his men, and Sherman and I were facing a firing squad of spear throwers. You can do this to me. I am only an observer from the UN. You are Pizarro, and you and your fellow conquerors shall perish. Golly, Mr. Peabody, they're going to throw spears at us. You mean they'll try to throw them, Sherman? Spear throwers, get ready. Get set, aim, fire. With all their might, the firing squad tossed their spears. However, halfway to the targets, the spears suddenly slowed to a slow drift and practically crept toward us. It's magic! No, atmosphere. You see, up here at 20,000 feet, things don't behave in the general manner, and those spears lose all their resiliency at this altitude. Hmm. Here they come now. It was a simple task to catch the spears and send them back where they came from. Of course, even though they returned just as slowly as they came, they nonetheless managed to pin each and every Inca facing us including the chief. We give them up. You conquer us. Well, that did it, Mr. Peabody. Now maybe everyone can live in peace together. Only time will decide that. Oh, my, this is a glorious view up here. I'll say. The Andes are really something to see. Some of those mountains just across the way, Sherman. Uh, those are called the Amos Mountains. They're brothers to the Andes. I never heard of them. You never heard of the Amos and Andes?
Burroughs got awfully close to the missing bank money last time. Close, but not near enough, for Boris Badenov, disguised as a lady moose, made off with a satchel full of swag, leaving our two heroes with an identical valise containing three pairs of socks and a peanut butter sandwich. Well, I only got one thing to say. What's that? Half he's on a sandwich. Little did our friends know that as they munched the sandwich, they were the target of three pairs of sinister eyes belonging to the light-fingered five minus two. Is that the uh, satchel three-finger? Yeah, but where's the double cross and baby face? These guys must have knocked him off. Well, let's swipe the suitcase and then blast him. Uh, how about blasting him first and then swiping the suitcase? Meanwhile, babyface Braunschweiger, alias Boris Badenov, had reached the Prospite Falls Railroad Station. Quick, what time leaves the next train for Skinnyapolis? He should be along about half past. Good, I'll wait. You want to buy a ticket? You sell it, kiddo, and I'll pay for it with this. I, 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 of course, here you are. Just a minute, chum. You forgot to give me mine change. And under the menace of Boris's weapon, the clerk had to hand over the entire receipts for the day. Mm, not bad. Here's a tip for crooks and bandits everywhere. Next time, try the train. Meanwhile, a short distance away, the three hoodlums were creeping nearer and nearer our friends. Mmm, that was mighty tasty, Rocky. Any seconds on the peanut butter sandwiches? I don't think so, but let's look. And Rocky opened the straw valise. Nothing left but three pairs of socks, Bullwinkle. I'd rather have a sandwich. Well, let's get back to town, Bullwinkle. You see that slug? The money's gone. Yeah, that means baby faces pulled a triple cross. Well, do I blast them? Of course not. They don't have the money. Oh, I could use a pair of socks. Never mind. We gotta find Babyface. But back at the train station, Babyface was gazing up the track, waiting for the next train out of town. I thought you said train was due half past. Jeez. Half past four or half past five? Half past October. October? Raskolnikov. But it'll be right on time, give or take a week. A week? Oh, boy. I could run to Skinniapolis quicker than that. And grabbing his suitcase full of loot, Boris started off down the tracks. But in a moment, he had spotted something that brought him to a halt. For there on the siding was a small handcar. In a few seconds, Boris was pumping the handcar toward the big city and safety. Yeah, he sort of do-it-myself railroad. Little did he know that just ahead was a grade crossing where Rocky and Bullwinkle were just preparing to pass over the tracks. Just a second, Rocky. What is it, Bullwinkle? Can't be too careful crossing railroad tracks, you know. You always stop. Look, and listen. Bullwinkle, are you all right? I'm not making book on it, but I think so. Yes, Bullwinkle's mighty frame had survived the impact. Not so the handcar. Gee, Bullwinkle, it's a total loss. And here's the fellow that was on it. It's that gangster. He's unconscious. You know, I'll bet his first words when he comes to will be, where am I? How come? That's what I always say. But just then, Boris's eyes opened and he said, stick him up. Well, that's different, Bullwinkle. Yeah, but it's not much of an improvement. But we haven't done anything, Mr. Braunschweiger, babyface Braunschweiger. Haven't we met before, Mr. Babyface? Have we met before? Oh, boy. But we're not going to meet again. How can you be sure? It's such a small world. Yeah, but you won't be in it. Well, is Boris really going to finish off our heroes? And if so, what will happen to our show? Be with us next time for Boris Medinov and his friends. <laughs> as if our time has just about run out. Just enough left to tell him who the sponsor was. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Ooh. We're late again, Bullwinkle. Right. Bye now. See you next time.